We like to say that all people are creative, but technically speaking, that's not really true. I mean, of course, everyone is creative to some degree, but statistically speaking, it's only a very small percentage of the population that's like really creative, like artistically, innovatively inclined. Saying everyone is creative is like saying everyone can do math. It's true up to a certain point, but there's no denying that some people are more inclined and gifted towards being astronauts and physicists. And not everyone is willing to take on the level of discipline and study required to hone that raw talent and develop the skills to be really good at it. What's essential for the average person, like balancing a checkbook or multiplication tables, is only the beginning for a virologist. The same is true of creativity and art. There is something unique and special about this gift, which carries with it not status and honor, but responsibility. The responsibility to make. Just like those who study and serve in the maths and sciences, artists and makers have an essential role to play in our societies. What if that calling goes beyond mere self-expression to what artist and scholar Deborah Haynes calls the realm of prophetic criticism and visionary imagination? What if we, like Walter Brueggemann, saw artistic work as a ministry of imagination? Why does it seem scary to consider the mythical and prophetic power of artistic capacity? In spite of caution from religious critics against the slippery slope into idol-making, the Bible encourages a vision for artists as tabernacle makers. Artists who create in concert with God to make the holy visible in our daily lives through beauty and wonder. I believe that the arts are a language given to us as a gift. A way to connect and communicate beyond where logical thought and words can travel. God's creation of the natural world and even of the order of love is his constant communication to us. And Jesus' invitation is to develop the eyes to see so that we may take notice of God's kingdom in our midst. Conversely, we are given creative capacity to express the deepest parts of our hearts and to speak about the things which defy logic ask the questions we have only groans and no words for. The arts are the means by which we explore the deep existential questions of what it means to be human. Why am I here? What does it mean to love another person? How do I exist in pain and suffering? And they're also the way we express our deepest fears and our greatest joys, the things that move before and beyond logical language that have the capacity to reach out and touch and connect with the lives of others. A biblical model of prophetic artistry imagines a humble capacity to hold up an image of the world as it is, while calling forth visions for the world as God intends it to be. As an artist committed to working in this way, we maintain the ability to hold incongruity, discord, and juxtaposition lightly in our being and the capacity to make and create artifacts which draw our attention to something higher or at least something beyond ourselves. They help us turn and tune our inmost desires and longings toward their ultimate goal wholeness in God, our creator and sustainer. This is no ordinary gift. Such an artist sees their calling not as a means of building themselves up or making a name for themselves or even making their mark, but rather sees their gift as just that, a gift given for service to the people of God for the glorification of God. The trouble is, when we say things like this in Christian circles, we can often hear it too simplistically. 
thinking what's meant is to create art only for use in church or creating churchy art. But those are neither the limits of what glorifies God, nor are they always the best examples of art that glorifies God. The scope has to be widened considerably to include every part of life, including and especially the public square, if it's going to have any effect on the larger culture we're called to create and live in. I'd love to see Christians employing these artistic languages less as tools for didactic evangelism or teaching and more in their natural mode as signposts and evidence of God's kingdom alive and at work all around us. As an artist of faith, I have struggled my whole life to justify and integrate these two pieces of myself, not realizing that they are woven together by design. My artistic gifts, and and more than that, my artistic sensibilities are intricately tied with a knowledge or a sense of God, of, of who God is and how he operates. It's through my creative lens, my imaginative lens, my sensing lens that I've gotten something of who God is, something that doesn't quite come across in sermons or books or even in the life of the church. But I do find it mirrored back to me in the fictional writings of C.S. Lewis and in paintings and music, not usually the stuff of formal theology or doctrine. I also see it in the contemplative tradition of the ancient desert fathers and mothers, in the visions of Teresa of Avila and the mystic sensibility of Ignatius of Loyola, even in Mother Teresa, whose actions were driven more by a mystical sense of the reality of Christ in every person she saw in front of her than in an ethical conviction to help. She reenacted Christ's salvific work every day, calling it forth into being in a tangible way. And that's the crux, making the intangible tangible, the invisible visible. Today, I believe that God is raising up artists, creatives, and makers as wise-hearted ones for a similar task to the one in Exodus, to make his presence visible in a thousand particular ways, filling them with his spirit, gifting them, and calling them to discipleship and commitment to serve in the same way. In Bezalel and Aholiab, we have the prototype of artists ordained to serve, not as missionaries or pastors, but as artists. If the Israelites desperately needed to be shaped by the tangible presence of God in their daily lives, why should we think that we are different now? And if God felt it necessary to ordain artists for the purpose of making himself visible to them, wouldn't it make sense that God never stopped? And wouldn't it make sense that now in the 21st century, when more than ever we are cocooned by images and media, that God would raise up an army of creatives, fill them with his spirit, and make himself known in ways that sermons and church services just don't even have the opportunity to anymore. I'm imagining that many of you who are artists and makers hearing this might have a little trouble even wrapping your heads around this. It sounds too grand and too self-aggrandizing to consider being called by God. Because we have forgotten the artist's call. We've forgotten what they were ordained to do. We've forgotten that they're not here at the end of the chain of command to be bridled into manipulating people to think or do something. We've forgotten that God speaks directly to them as well. We forget that God has called them to the ministry of imagination to help us to learn to see with the eyes of our hearts, with the mind of Christ. I believe the church in the West today, and the West in general, is suffering, at least in part because we have forgotten the call of the artist to work in the world as culture makers and shapers. And it would be wise for the church to look around 
and identify the seedling artists and designers and makers and game designers and filmmakers and musicians and illustrators and authors and poets and dancers and visual and performing and digital and community-based artists of all kinds that God has planted many times outside the institutional church and is even now raising up and beginning to harvest so that we may prepare them for the work to which he, he has called them. These artists are coming to fruit-bearing season. Will they be ready for the task ahead? And for you who were called, for you who were planted by God, often in inhospitable soil, I want to affirm your call. I want you to hear the story of Bezalel and Oholiab and see a way forward, a way of faithfulness, humility, clarity, and extreme freedom and fulfillment, one that is deeply rooted in disciplined practice and accountable community. The point is to be a really good artist as God intended you must apply the wisdom of the heart. That is proper attuning and attention of your life and will to God's will in service to that which you are called to be about. So this is being who you were created to be, a child of God, and making what you were created to make in service to God for whatever purposes God puts in front of you to do. The way to wholeness as an artist and a person of faith is to recognize that these two pieces of yourself are already integrated by God's design. One makes the other possible. And the fullness of your call comes to fruition only through living a deeply devoted, wise-hearted way of life. By wisdom, a house is built. And through understanding, it is established. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with rare and beautiful treasures. Proverbs 24, 3-4. The Wise Heart at One series from the Verge Now podcast is presented by Convergence, hosted and written by Lisa Cole Smith, with original music by Jay Smith and produced by me, Dan ABH, recorded on location at the lab at Convergence, located in Alexandria, Virginia. For more information on the Wise Heart at Ones, please visit vergenow.org. You can rate and review this episode on Apple Podcasts. You can also listen and stream all of our podcasts on Spotify, Apple, Podbean, and many, many more.